Uh, thank you very much, uh, Grishma, for an excellent presentation. And I want to thank all of our speakers for their insightful talks. Uh, we are now going to explore some additional topics through a conversation with the speakers. Uh, audience questions have been coming in uh, throughout, and I will um, interleave these questions with my own. Uh, many of the questions reflect similar themes, so I'm going to try to pull these together um, into um, some key questions. Uh, but let's start with the first question. Um, earlier this week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its Working Group 2 report titled Climate Change 2022, Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability. One of the key takeaways from the report is that the harmful effects of climate change from global to personal scales may be accumulating faster than our ability to adapt. So given the content and urgency of the report, I would like to ask you, uh, our speakers, if you can each briefly share with us something that you found particularly striking in this new report. Um, and let's start with Jisong and uh, go down the, the line. Sure. Um, I mean, it's a thick report and there's a lot in there, but I, if I could just highlight one key idea, and you mentioned it briefly, you know, it's, it's this notion of the, the speed and effectiveness of adaptation and who will be able to access adaptation at what cost. Um, my understanding of the report is that we're now beginning to un, you know, unravel the really messy details of how adaptation will or will not happen. And I think it actually raised a big question for me, uh, which is you know, this open question of, OK, we know, we know climate change is already happening. We know that adaptation, in some cases, when it happens, can be effective. I think we still don't know all that much about what kinds of barriers to adaptation exist and what the role of public policy is in remediating those barriers, because I think it really comes down to a lot of uh, dirty details we don't have much data on yet. Um, but at, at a high level, you know, it is interesting to me, given the evolution of IPCC reports over, over time, um, you know, just how much it has gone from a, you know, uh, adaptation as something we really don't want to think about too, too squarely because mitigation is so, so essential to this fundamental recognition that we have to do both at the same time. Yeah, so I think that um, coming from the perspective of someone who's focused on health outcomes, I, the thing that I see in this iteration that I think is highlighted, even beyond how it's been highlighted in previous versions, is the need to focus on vulnerable communities and the impacts in vulnerable communities. And there's this idea from public health practitioners that if we're being protective of the most vulnerable, we will naturally be protective of the health of all. And I think that that gets really highlighted in this iteration in a way that is sharper and clearer, while at the same time underscoring all of the different health pathways through which climate change is impacting our health now and will in the future that we still need to study, um, some of which have been highlighted here today as well. For me, this report was sad because it highlighted how much worse things are getting. Uh, but deep in the report, I also found some hope in that the panel basically reported we know what to do. It is now the political will to make it happen. But we actually, we, we have basically everything we need to start making massive improvements in adaptations. And so I'm hoping uh, it's kind of a call to arms. For me, this report really highlighted the urgency in deploying solutions, not just developing them. It implied that we need low-cost solutions. We'll need to take into account geographical heterogeneities, differences in livelihoods, lifestyles, and develop <clears throat> technologies and solutions that can be deployed in an equitable manner. At a personal level, it made me think more deeply about possible inequities and some of the solutions that we as a society uh, might contribute to in an unexpected manner if we deploy some of these carbon capture utilization storage technologies. What can be done to actually prevent those inequalities from arising? 
how can we deploy some of the technologies that we talked about in a manner that is fair and equitable? Those were all some of the questions that this IPCC report raised for me at a very personal level that I'd like to work through in the approaches that we take to developing technology. Thank you, uh, everyone, for these, these thoughts. Um, so let's delve a little bit deeper into the question of um, uh, equity and uh, impacts, uh, because that has come up again and again. So uh, this is a question for uh, Amrutha. Um, you've described in your presentation in your work the direct personal impacts of climate change on individuals. Um, do you think that climate change communication that is focused on individual impacts in addition to the global scale should play an important role in precipitating action on climate change? And if so, what are some effective strategies in your opinion? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And uh, in my experience, people understand that the climate is impacting them and it's impacting their health. They may not talk about it in the same ways that we as academics talk about it, but they know that something is happening, something is changing. The change might be in their neighborhood, it might be in their community, it might be in their city, it might be in their country or across the world. Whatever scale it's happening at, people are aware that it's happening and they are aware of the health impacts. Um, so I think that messaging that is particularly effective seeks to not just prescriptively tell people that this is what they should care about, but ask them what they do care about and talk to them about the ways in which climate is intersectional across all of these different important things, the economics, the lifestyle factors, the uh, vulnerable communities, the existing health conditions and the exacerbation of those existing health conditions. Um, some sense of immediacy, I think, is also needed. Um, we, you know, I think in my experience, the idea of climate change and the impacts of climate change has really evolved from this theoretical thing that's happening in the future to something that's happening now and is already having impacts now. And I think that if we can change it to those terms, we can start to say it's not just a hypothetical thing that will happen in the future. It's something where we understand, um, you know, there, there are impacts now. And, you know, as Joan was mentioning before about the IPCC report, we also know some of the ways in which we can implement some solutions. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is, again, understanding and characterizing what individuals prioritize for themselves, I think, is a really helpful way to strategize and to message. Um, different communities are going to face different impacts. It's not that the climate is going to uniformly cause heat waves in every single place. Some place might be heat waves, some places might be hurricanes or storms, some places might be power outages, some places might be um, flooding or drought, wildfires. There's so many different ways in which the climate is tied into all of these events. Um, so understanding what communities care about and what individuals care about, and then targeting messaging to those particular issues and to the solutions to those partic particular issues, I think is really important. Thank you. And I, I want to continue kind of along the same theme, and this is a question for Joan. Um, so as we've seen with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic uh, and, and other previous examples, global crises tend to exacerbate underlying disparities and inequalities, and it seems clear from um, all of your presentations that climate change is no different. Um, at the same time, climate change research highlights the interconnectedness of impacts across the globe. Um, and so my question is, do you think that this interconnectedness provides us with an opportunity to improve global equity through climate policies? And again, if so, what, what are some effective policies or approaches that, that you can think about? <laughs> this person read my paper that says opportunity for equity, so it's the perfect question. Um, I absolutely think we're coming up on this time where we have opportunity upon opportunity to make decisions that improve equity. We know historically environmental exposures have not been evenly distributed. Um, so we have problems like power plants cited disproportionately in communities of color in the United States. But we're going to go through a huge energy transition. So can we make energy policy take equity into account? Some of the work I've done has been around thinking about um, looking at characteristics in terms of emissions that fire coal-fired power plants and other polluting facilities and the composition of people living around them such that we can prioritize which plants we take offline first to reduce inequities in exposure 
and hopefully reduce disparities in health that have been really highlighted during this pandemic. So that's just one example, but I think in all facets of our society, we're going to have big changes occurring. And I, I do think those will all provide opportunities. And so we, we need to push equity to be part of those policies. Thank you. Um, a question for Grishma. Um, you mentioned um, a cost of about $100 per ton for uh, removal. And um, is this um, accessible um, in terms of cost uh, only in countries like the US and other uh, wealthy countries? Or do you think that this is, can be accessible globally um, to ensure that we really have this process running across the world? That's an excellent question. Um, so I would say the number that I quoted was based on discussions with some program managers within the US Department of Energy. So that is really coming specifically from looking very intentionally at some of the technologies that are currently being developed for deploying carbon removal at scale. And the US is leading, I would say, one of the is leading, is among the leading nations uh, in this particular research area. Having said that, I think there are tremendous opportunities in developing countries for synergistic integration of carbon removal with the economic practices they engage in. What do I mean by that? So there are ways to enhance soil carbon without needing to go up to $100 per ton of CO2 removed. There are practices that can be implemented in the way we dispose our waste, in the way we consume energy, in the way we, uh, I guess, harness our transportation services that can continue to drive um, CO2 emissions down. In terms of CO2 emissions removed, I think some of the easiest approaches that can be implemented are around afforestation and deforestation. The challenge, though, is with quantification. If we were to plant a tree, how fast is it going to grow? How many trees are we planting? What kind of quantification metrics can we get around that? I think those are some of the challenges we need to resolve if we actually need to start quantifying how much carbon removal we are able to realize and to get investment in these technologies. Thank you. A uh, question for Jisung. Um, so you talked about the um, issue of uh, the impacts on learning and on uh, worker safety in terms of heat. Uh, at least in the context of learning, one uh, possibility, of course, is installing air conditioners, right. but that has uh, somewhat of a negative uh, feedback loop. Totally. Um, so how do we think about that? How do we think about those kind of short-term versus long-term solutions um, as, you know, as they interact with, with adaptation? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't mean to be coy, but that's a question that I'm hoping that you know, we can all help each other to answer because I don't have a good answer to, to be honest. I can attempt one because it does keep me up at night a little bit. So you, you sort of laid it out, right? Um, we're beginning to see compelling evidence that air conditioning uh, and other cooling measures, but in particular air conditioning, can be very effective at blunting the health or learning or labor-related consequences of extreme heat. But air conditioning on you know, current electricity grids adds to carbon emissions. Okay, I've told you the obvious. But and my understanding is that it is a growing share of carbon emissions, especially as middle-income countries uh, developing and middle-income countries in the world. I'm thinking you know, India, China, where there's not good data, but uh, the available data suggests you know, air conditioning penetration is well below you know, 20 or 30 percent of households as these households become uh, you know, relatively, relative to where they used to be wealthier, they will demand these services because they are life-saving in many cases. What does that mean for CO2 emissions? Yeah, something that uh, is certainly on my mind. It, it, in one sense, it only underscores the urgency of decarbonizing electricity grids, right? Because I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is that as long as we can solve the HFC, CFC problem, which for the most part in developed countries we have, there's a technological fix to it. There's nothing inherent to air conditioning that should lead to greenhouse gas emissions if the electricity is being sourced from renewable energies. And so 
obviously to tell you know, the Indian government, OK, you can add as many ACs as you want as long as it comes from, from renewables. That's a bogus proposition. But in some ways, it just underscores to me the urgency of right, getting mitigation fast. Because adaptation, uh, to your earlier question, is going to happen. You know, the private market is going to send signals toward adaptation, whether we like it or not. Right? Um, and that will drive up emissions if it is from uh, an electricity base that is not sufficiently decarbonized. Can I just add one last point to this, though? Because it's sort of a, an ongoing theme. I, and it kind of speaks to the role of, I think, the role of uh, data science and academia generally in, in this sort of new, uh, in this future of adaptation to the warming that is coming down the pike, which is that, you know, my understanding is that private markets are going to do a very good job of adapting, but in a way that will benefit those who have the ability to pay for that kind of information. Right? Already, the McKinsey's of the world, the Jupiter Intel's of the world are investing many millions into adaptation consulting because the information right, about how to protect one's assets from climate change is going to be valuable. And I'm worried about a scenario where that information is not equitably available. And to the extent that information is a, a public good, I, I personally see an important role uh, of you know, academia generally in science, right, applied science, in providing that information in a way, in collaboration right, with local governments, that it can be more equitably deployed, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, Joan, do you want to um, add to this in terms of the impact on the power grid? Um, if you, know, you turn on all these additional <coughs> AC units, is, is this something that can be handled uh, with, the current, with the current infrastructure? Uh, no, right? Because the, the, when we, we want to turn these on, it's already hot, unfortunately. I think some of, I mean, I was honestly thinking about maybe winter break goes away for schools and summer break becomes longer. Hmm. I mean, there may be other things that we have to do around this behaviorally. Um, but yeah, I mean, decarbonizing is, of course, the key thing. We should be getting solar panels on every school. Mm -hmm. And just, just, you know, in California, this could provide the vast majority of what's needed. And it, I think you're spot on that there's nothing inherently wrong with AC. Um, so that's my two cents. So we're going to go back to some of these topics and, and pull on them uh, a bit more. But I wanted to uh, kind of switch gears for a moment and ask a question that's a bit more personal. Uh, and I want to ask it again of all of you. Um, so climate change is, is one of, if not the most severe problem that's facing the planet and, and humanity. And there is survey after survey of uh, young people in particular find that the majority of respondents feel extremely worried about climate change, um, that they find that um, they state that it negatively impacts their daily lives and their mental health. Um, similarly, just a few days ago, the New York Times ran an article about a trio of climate scientists who um, are calling for a moratorium on climate change research as a, quote, means to expose and renegotiate the broken science society contract. So this leads me to wonder, uh, what is it like uh, for you as, as young researchers working in, in this area on a, on a topic that's generating such an emotional impact? Uh, how do you or can you compartmentalize uh, your work and, and your personal feelings about this? And maybe we'll start with Grishma. I think that's an excellent question. Um, more than 10 years ago when I started working on my PhD, people looked at me and they said, you're working on that? And now when I look back, I think about how much time I spent studying the CO2 molecule and its chemistry and how I was able to, I would say, just engross myself in all the different ways the CO2 molecule can be manipulated. And for me, personally, that was very fascinating. And now, as a faculty member, and having the agency to make this contribution, I really regard it as a privilege, if you would. And so I, I would say that it's not so much of a burden. I think I approach it from the perspective of making a contribution and deriving a lot of satisfaction from being able to probe some of the science and develop new technologies. Whether they get scaled up or not, I think is really dependent on market factors. But I think being able to contribute to what is needed in society in a timely manner, and also having the opportunity to train students, 
to address this emerging challenge is really a privilege and I'm grateful for it. And I understand that this is a great source of anguish for many, many communities. And that is also one of the factors that drives us to do what we do. I guess I would say my always low level of anxiety makes it really easy to get out of bed in the morning and go to work. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's, it's definitely hard. I don't have a great solution to this, but it definitely serves as an amazing motivator to keep going and keep uh, pulling more students in, keep working on interdisciplinary collaborations that we're going to need to make the change that has to happen. It's, you know, there's, there's no real other option than to keep working on this and continue growing the team that's working on this crisis because that's the only way we're going to get out of it in a world that we recognize. So, uh, yeah, it's hard. I, I, I teach in at Columbia the Masters of Public Health core, which all 600 of our students take, and probably 50 of them email me after the climate change lecture kind of asking for help and resources because it's so difficult to deal with the content that we're covering. And this year I thought I made it much more positive. But apparently, you know, it's, this is something that we're all going to grapple with as a society. So I don't know that we're coping, but we're going to have to keep working together to cope and move forward. Yeah. Um, listening to the other two speakers that have talked about this before me, I was trying to think of a time when I wasn't aware of the fact that climate change was an issue. And I can't really remember that. I feel like I've grown up in a generation that has always known that climate change is a problem. And it's a problem that we are going to have to be the ones to start fixing because nobody before us did. So if we put that as you know, one of the problems that we have to grapple with as individuals and as a society, I can't, I mean, on the one hand, right, it's, it's kind of a downer, but on the other hand, what an opportunity to contribute to our society and to our planet, like getting the expertise in this area, being able to contribute, joining this fantastic cohort of individuals who have similarly been interested in this issue and in this topic and who have received training in order to bring together this collective skill set to try and address this problem that fundamentally needs to be addressed. It's not, it's not can we do it, it is we must do it and we must figure out how. And so let's get all of the best and brightest minds together. And you know, one of the best pieces of advice that I got from um, one of the senior members of my research group many, many years ago was in academia, things happen on long time scales. So any sense of drama that you have around the publication that you're putting together is entirely self-manufactured. <laughs> and in some sense, I do believe that that might be the case, right? Academia does operate on long lag times. So I put in a paper now for consideration and it maybe get, gets published in a year from now or six, you know, 18 months from now. But at the same time, there is this sense of urgency that we have because we're all aware that we need to start moving forward with implementing solutions to climate change. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the other thing that I'll say that Joan already said really well is that it's easy to get up and go to work every day because this is what motivates me and this is what drives me. And I'm really lucky that I get to do it with a fantastic group of colleagues and collaborators who feel the same way. Yeah, I mean, what, what can I add? Um, I, I'd like to echo this sentiment that um, there is a sense in which as long as you are engaging in the good personal hygiene of not letting uh, you know, moral outrage or, or fear you know, drift into the territory of anxiety and worry, because worry is just not helpful, period. Um, clairvoyant view of you know, how bad the situation is and channeling that in a way that motivates wise discernment and effort, I find to be, uh, a, I guess, a benefit of working on this topic. But at the risk of sounding more contrarian than I mean to, I, I will share a personal struggle. Um, and it kind of gets to something you, were, you just mentioned, Amruta, about not only the time lags, but the distinction between the scientific method and knowledge creation and knowledge application or advocacy. Uh, I do struggle with this internally because the urgency of the problem and because the 
high degree of applicability of some of my, my own work and all of our work actually to pressing policy decisions. Um, you know, fundamental to the scientific pro process is an open mind, right? A beginner's mind of acknowledging that you don't know what you don't know and being open to what the scientific method and the data tells you is, you know, the reality. And so I, I, I've struggled with that. The way I've temporarily made peace with that is um, by noting that one can choose with one's heart the questions that one is interested in and intuit to be of importance, even based on limited information, and then let the machinery of the scientific process provide a dispassionate and objective answer to the questions you ask. So that, that's the way I've squared that circle, but if anyone has better advice on that, I'd, I'd love to hear it, because it is a disconnect, and it is it does lead to a little bit of schizophrenia, mm -hmm. yeah. No, thank, thank you for, for sharing these, these um, personal thoughts and um, especially for, for you as, as people who are kind of emerging as leaders in the field. Um, so let's go back to, to kind of somewhat more technical questions. Um, so a uh, question for you, Jisung, um, but I think others can comment on it as well. This is something that came up, um, I think, again and again in uh, a lot of questions. Um, so again, in light of these disparate impacts of climate change, um, how do we motivate policymakers, corporations um, that may be more insulated, at least in the short term, from some of the impacts? Yeah. Um, and similarly, how do we ensure that the impacted, underserved communities have a voice in, in policy circles? It's a great question. I wish, we, I wish we had a political scientist on the panel. Um, <laughs> yeah. It kind of comes down to your theory of change, but let me give you my take on it. So um, I've been pleasantly surprised at what seems like a step change in public awareness of the immediacy of climate change's impacts, even among those who historically, you know, were, were let's just say, um, I won't even go so far as disinformation, but prone to be on the other side of, of that uh, coin. Um, I think, so there's a sense in which climate change is a global public good problem and, and emissions reduced in one country is the same as emissions reduced in any other country. And so, you know, there's a global collective action piece to this, but it kind of, I've, it kind of comes down to local politics in terms of the, where the rubber meets the road in terms of emissions reducing policies. And there, um, uh, I think it really does behoove uh, you know, both academics and practitioners to apply the knowledge that we have in a way that messages locally, in ways that are effective at mobilizing, uh, mobilizing politics locally so that the action that is necessary can be taken. And, and that will, that, what that looks like will vary, mm -hmm. right? Um, the United States has its own peculiarities when it comes to climate politics, and I think that has to be borne in mind in terms of you know, messaging that, mm -hmm. um, messaging our findings in a way that can actually lead to action. If I could yes, please. maybe jump in on that. Um, so having some experience on a different track, I guess, in the same vein, but focused more on the implementation of an adoption of plans that are specifically targeting the health impacts of climate. Um, I think that this is a trend that we're seeing in a lot of different settings, a lot of different communities. Um, you know, the ones that I have the most uh, experience with are heat action plans. But I think that you know the city of Boston has a climate climate adaptation plan that incorporates all sorts of different components from um, renewable energy to green building design, sustainable infrastructure, um, prevention of flooding at the at the waterfront, um, and you know we've become involved with local communities in the Mystic River watershed to try and identify some of the issues that um, residents in these communities care about. I think that there are a couple of different things that I just wanted to point out on this point, um, specific to the health side, which is that you know when we're trying to implement these policies, it's been my experience that we have to be really pragmatic and very realistic about the targets that are being um, proposed as parts of these plans. You know, we I had the experience; it was kind of a surreal experience of 
taking my epidemiologic study into the office of a municipal planner and having them say, you must be joking, we can't declare a heat wave at this temperature because every single day in the summer will be declared a heat wave. So it's, it's going to, the message is going to be lost. So you really have to do the study, do the data science, and maybe this goes back to an earlier point as well. We, we do that and we're kind of agnostic. We're presenting the results as they come to us. But then it's up to the policymakers and the communities themselves to take that information and to implement it in the way that makes the most sense for them. Um, and then the other thing that I will mention too is that as a part of the development of these heat ad adaptation plans, um, there's you know recommendations that can be made based on what we understand are the best practices. So, you know, the example that I have is in New York, they say go to a cooling center, go to an air conditioned building such as a mall or a movie theater. You can't tell people in India to go to a mall or a movie theater during a heat wave. You have to come up with the local solutions that are the translation of these best practices to, again, the way that makes the most sense for the communities where it's meant to be implemented. Yeah, John. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on this idea of um, getting policymakers involved much earlier when it comes to climate health, climate and health studies or climate and studies. We just experienced this with oil and gas wells in California. I'm on a panel to try to protect public health. And basically, none of the studies that have been done are very useful because of the way they want to protect public health. And we haven't studied it in a way that's helpful for policymaking. And so getting that done early on, I think is super helpful. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also mention, um, related to disparities, there's examples already of ways that disparities have been addressed through climate policy. So California's cap and trade bill actually allocates portions of its profits to communities identified by Cal Envirus Green, which is this environmental justice screening tool that identifies disadvantaged communities in the state along several lines, um, environmental, sociodemographic. And so these communities actually benefit from cap and trade in California. And so this is the sort of thing that we can embed in climate policy. And then I also just lastly wanted to mention communities and what local communities can do. I mean, one big thing is vote. And so we need to get more people registered to vote. We need to have voting lines drawn that make sense. Mm -hmm. um, but as just a quick anecdote, in a study we found in California about California super emitters, so these are point sources of pollution that emit disproportionate amounts of methane. We found that as the proportion of people living near these, uh, the, as the proportion of people voting increased at the census tract level in California, rates of having a super emitter nearby went way down. And so we see that when people vote, they can actually change their local community. So thanks. Thank you. Um, Krishma, I think this, this is uh, probably a question that uh, should go to you. Um, so extreme temperatures, um, you know, we talked about the um, damage on, on health to, to people, but also damage infrastructure, uh, transportation, bridges, the power grid. Um, as, as we're thinking about building up infrastructure to decarbonize, along with all of this existing infrastructure, are we, are we keeping up with, with the rate of, of change of, of temperatures and, and the rising, overall rising temperatures? That's a great question. Um, I think as we look to the future, it's important to incorporate the impact of a changing climate into design. And when I say design, it's design of everything, right? It can go into the design of my cell phone, what is the sustainability of the materials that go into my phone, can go into the design of this bottle that's right here. Is this plastic biodegradable? What is the life, lifetime of this plastic? How do I come up with the material schemes? How do I design it so it's environmentally more benign? To thinking about how we build um, infrastructure and when I and just you know in the context of a building I can give you one example it's not just about how you build it's also about how you take it down it's also about how you deconstruct a building right and that has major implications for emissions so it is said that I'll give you one example in this context if you try to build a mature a building with mono materials right not too many vari variations in the materials that are used it's actually easier to deconstruct a building it's actually easier to recycle those components. 
so I think climate awareness, increase, particularly increasing levels of cl climate awareness and climate consciousness needs to permeate every single aspect of our life. And that in turn is going to influence how we eat, what we wear, how we transport ourselves from point A to point B, um, the kind of products we use, the places where we live in, I think it's gonna to have to permeate everything. Okay, that's great. Um, so with that, uh, we need to conclude our program. Um, I want first and foremost to thank all of our speakers uh, for their important and fascinating presentations, which really, I think, expanded our way of thinking about the science and the impacts of climate change on individuals, on communities, on societies, and on the planet as a whole. Uh, thank you as well to our in-person and virtual uh, audiences for excellent questions. Today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. For information about upcoming Radcliffe virtual programs, including next week's um, science lecture with Dr. Timnit Gebru on artificial intelligence and equity, or to see videos of past events, please visit www.radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and take care.